Great pleasure to be here as a uh, uh, session chair. Uh, so uh, we have uh, four speakers uh, in the first session, and then seven speakers uh, in this afternoon. And uh, our uh, first, uh, first speaker is keynote speaker, uh, Professor uh, Asigan Helni, uh, Associate Professor in Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at MIT. He finished uh, his master and PhD uh, in mechanical engineering at MIT. His primary research is uh, in heat transfer with emphasis on understanding the science of energy, energy transport, uh, storage conversion at the uh, atomic level, along with the development of new industrial scale energy technology to mitigate uh, climate change. Uh, the title uh, is uh, Sun in a Box, Thermal Energy Grid Storage Using Multi-Junction Photovoltaics. Let's welcome the speaker. All right, thanks for having me. Um, make sure this works. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about a um, energy storage approach that we are developing. Um, we call it affectionately, uh, it's called sun in a box. Oh, point it that way, there we go. Um, so this just deals with the storage problem. I'm gonna assume some level of familiarity with this problem, um, basically the cost of Solar and wind over the last decade has dropped um, a lot, such that now in the sunniest and windiest places on Earth, solar and wind is the cheapest form of electricity on Earth. And um, the problem now is that you might assume that that means that, that those technologies will immediately proliferate and we will we've solved the problem. We uh, can now convert the entire stationary power uh, sector over to renewable energy, but it is not that simple. Um, it turns out that there is another issue, which is the storage problem, which has to do with the fact that, you know, if you just take PV as an example, um, in the afternoons when the sun is about to go down, um, the PV output is going to drop quite rapidly. If you were to have a large fraction of the grid electricity supplied by that PV, uh, you would have a very fast switch that would have to happen between PV output and some other technology with now, which now has to kick in and make up the difference. Uh, that shift, that load shift is on the order of gigawatts and over a course of one to two hours. And uh, that's actually really stressful for um, turbines to do to ramp that quickly. Uh, so stressful that it actually would uh, affect their lifetime and their cost, and therefore um, it's very costly to operate them that way. So as a result, uh, there's been some work. Uh, this is work taken specifically from a paper by Paul Denholm, um, but there's been work looking at simulating the grid and quantifying how bad this effect is. And the long story short is that if you don't have any storage, and so this is even with 60% Flexibility. Flexibility here is to indicate some level of storage on the grid. Uh, but what this shows is that if you had even you know 60% flexibility, which is some storage, uh, you run into this limit where at around 15 to 20% uh, of the PV energy that you would want to supply to the grid completely gets thrown away. And so there, you're not you, you run into a limit of how much PV and uh, renewables you can actually put on the grid without enough storage. And so this shows that you definitely have to have lots more storage if you want to get to a fully renewable grid. Um, so the first thing you might think is, all right, well, we have lithium ion batteries, so let's just do PV and wind plus batteries. Uh, the problem is if you work out the cost of that, it turns out the batteries are more expensive than the PV and the wind. And so, um, this has necessitated a rather international movement um, amongst many researchers to really try to develop and find some alternative lower cost option for storing energy at very large scales for the grid. And so the approach that we have taken, um, I'll explain why in a minute, uh, is what we term thermal energy grid storage. There are a variety of different, material, uh, um, different systems that fall under this moniker that we've come up with called TEGS. Uh, but the basic idea of a TEGS system is that you take in electricity, you convert it to heat with, in some form or in some way, you store the heat rather than storing the electricity, and then you later convert it back to electricity. So it's electricity in, 
store it as heat, but then electricity back out. So it basically acts just like a battery, all right? But you have this system down here where you do the storage and conversion of heat. Now, if you have taken a thermodynamics class, that would sound like a very stupid idea to do. Why? Because we just spent a lot of effort going from heat to electricity in the first place. All right? And so more than 90% of electricity comes from heat. Um, and we pay a very big thermodynamic penalty. So we end up throwing away, on average, almost 60% or so of the energy of the content of the fuel. We throw it away as waste heat because the conversion of heat to electricity is fundamentally limited by thermodynamics. So you got to pay that penalty once already. Why would you ever go from electricity back to heat only to pay the penalty again a second time? Um, and it turns out that there's one reason to do this, and it may not be obvious, but it's because storing heat can actually be 10 to 100 times cheaper than storing electricity. So you're going to take, we, we, we acknowledge from the beginning, we are going to take a big hit on efficiency in the sense that the total amount of energy that we're able to put back on the grid, the electricity in, um, I'm sorry, electricity out divided by the electricity in, which we call the round trip efficiency, that ratio is not going to be as high as we would like. Um, but where we win is in the fact that the energy itself can be stored very cheaply. So um, the first conversion is not bad, right? You can basically do run a resistor, and all of the electricity you put in can turn into heat. So you don't have to lose anything on the way in. It's on the way out where you're now converting a form of energy that has entropy to another form of energy that does not have entropy where you have to lose some. You have to have some other form of energy and this conversion to carry away the residual entropy that is not going to the electricity. And so this can never be 100% efficient. And so this is where you pay a penalty. All right, so let's talk about, well, why is it so cheap? So let's talk about just kind of from an atomic level, thinking about from a very fundamental standpoint, why is it cheaper to do this? Um, and I'll use the example of a battery, um, just as an, as an example. Um, in a battery, you have a low concentration of actual atoms that are associated with the energy storage, right? So very few atoms are actually active in a battery. Uh, it's a smaller percentage, but the amount of energy associated with each of those atoms is very large. So in the end, you end up with a pretty decent energy density in the range of a few hundred kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Uh, but your cost is high because you've got only a few atoms that are participating. So the rest of the atoms are like in the background. And they facilitate the motion and the exchange of energy and the discharge and charging of these atoms, atoms that are responsible for the energy. Um, but you need those other atoms to all stay in the same place because it all works on everything staying in order. And as you discharge it, it starts to heat up and you get some side reactions and some things get out of place. It affects the performance. And so this thing is very, very uh, dependent on having very pure materials. You can't tolerate a lot of impurities and defects and all kinds of things that can affect the battery performance. On the other end of the spectrum, heat. 100% of the atoms are participating. So all we are doing is storing the energy in the kinetic energy of the atoms. We are, they are cold, so they're not moving very fast. Then we heat them up, they move faster, and then we allow them to discharge and they move slower. And that process of going from low to high, back to low kinetic energy, and does not have any real intrinsic degradation mechanism, so to speak. You can cycle something as many times as you want from hot to cold, and it's not going to fall apart. So we get a very low amount of energy per atom. That change in kinetic energy is not very large. Um, but we get the advantage that we can deal with disordered systems and, and, and scrap materials and very impurity-tolerant configurations. So that's the benefit. We can have very long lifetime. We can use dirty materials so we can get the cost down. And so this is ultimately where this notion of storing heat being cheaper is coming from. So let's do a simple estimate, quick back of the envelope calculation just so you can convince yourself this number is very low. So by comparison, uh, cost of lithium ion batteries is in the range of, let's say, $400 per kilowatt hour now. Um, it's estimated, it's believed that they will get down to $150 per kilowatt hour um, at sufficiently large scales and economies of scale. Um, so let's use that as a point of comparison. So if you imagine I'm going to store, let's say, liquid silicon. Take the heat capacity. Take the cost of the material, which is about a buck fifty per kilogram. This is not semiconductor grade silicon that's going to go in a PV cell. This is dirty silicon. It's only like 98% pure. You've only really done one step from sand, which is remove the oxygen. So it's got the residual impurities in it. Um, and let's swing this material 
through a delta T, a, a change in temperature of let's say 500 degrees C. If you do that, you get the cost per unit energy, so the cost of storing one more unit of energy from the product of CP delta T, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, this is the cost divided by CP delta T, which comes out to $11.5 per kilowatt hour thermal. Now, this is thermal energy that you're, you're getting, not electricity. So you have to now account for the fact that you have to do this conversion, pay this penalty on efficiency. So let's just wave our hands for the moment and say, assume we're going to get something in the neighborhood of, let's say, 50% efficiency. That means the cost per unit energy of electricity is a factor of two higher. So it's about $22 uh, or $23 per kilowatt hour. But this is already, you know, compared to the price of lithium ion today, already a factor of 10 or more lower. Now move to another case. Suppose I go even dirtier. Let's go use scrap steel, essentially liquid iron storage. It's got a bunch of impurities in it. Um, Again, do the same calculation, same parameters. The big difference is scrap steel is only 10 cents a kilogram. Very, very cheap. So it's like an order of magnitude cheaper. So the final cost comes out down less than $4 per kilowatt hour. So this is like 100 times cheaper than current battery cost. So this is very attractive from that sense. If you can, this is the only benefit we get by doing this storage of heat, is we get a low cost per unit energy. That's the only thing we benefit from. And so it's important that this number be very, very low so we can get the full benefits of it, and then we're going to take a lot of hits in the rest of everything else we do. So another immediate question you might ask is, well, why would you store heat? If you're going to store heat, it's just going to leak back out. If I put a cup of hot coffee on this table and I leave it an hour or two later, it's not hot anymore. Why is it not hot? Because the energy is actually leaking to the environment. The environment's being warmed up, and the same thing happens if you try to store heat in a big container. The energy is, in fact, going to leak out. But the rate or the time scale over which it cools down to the environment's temperature is related to the surface area to volume ratio. So here's the time constant. If you do a simple lump capacitance analysis, you take the mass of the fluid, heat capacity, multiplied by the resistance. You've got some wall that's in the way, and you've got some insulation. So that insulation resistance helps slow down the time it takes, the, uh, the amount of time, increase the amount of time it takes to cool down. And so all that's here. And for a tank on the order of 10 meters in diameter, 10 meters tall, you end up with like tens of thousands of tons of liquid inside. So the mass is so huge, the time constant is on the order of months. So it takes a very, very long time for this to cool down. This approach is actually already, in a sense, commercialized in the sense that you can go to a concentrated solar power plant. They've got these giant tanks. And these tanks, once they're hot, they will stay hot. All right? So even if you've got to shut the plant down for a week, two weeks, three weeks, the, the molten salt is not going to cool off and freeze inside the tank. All right. Generally speaking, you design these tanks to be so large that you lose less than about 1% of the energy per day. So if you imagine cycling your battery every day, you only pay about a 1% penalty, penalty due to the heat leakage to the environment. So the real question next that we worked on is, how important is efficiency? So if you think about other storage technologies, you think about batteries, um, supercapacitors, um, uh, pumped hydro, a variety of different technologies, generally speaking, their efficiencies are very high, meaning they're in the 80s and 90s percentile, OK? Sometimes they get down to the mid to high 70s. But generally speaking, these, these technologies are quite efficient. Electricity in and electricity out are almost the same. And for that reason, we were unable to find necessarily a framework for how do you quantify how big of a penalty you pay on your total cost or your total value proposition when you now account for having a low efficiency. And so this is what we need to do because we know our efficiency is going to be low. So we need to know how important is this, this penalty and how do we quantify, um, quantify that effect. So let's start here. There's a minimum efficiency you can deal with which is the ratio of the uh, price at which you're going to sell electricity to the price at which you bought it. That's, to some extent, like a, a, a ratio. You can't go below that. Otherwise, by definition, you're losing money. Okay? And what we did is we went and looked through the literature, and it turns out the same author, Paul Denholm, who did the other studies of the grid, had quantified this effect. So he did simulation, this particular plot, could be changed or updated for different input data, but this is the general qualitative conclusion. Uh, so you did simulation of the PJM grid in the Northeast and looked at if you were to have a storage resource with this efficiency, these parameters, like this amount of storage, this many hours of storage, then here's how much money it would make 
due to arbitrage in the course of a year, meaning buy low, sell high, okay? And what you come up with is we extrapolated from his plot. There's effectively a, a plot of versus the number of hours that you're storing energy. You can see there's diminishing returns as you go up in the amount of storage you have. But as your round trip efficiency decreases, you get less value. You get paid less money. So this is in dollars per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt year. All right. So each year you get paid a certain amount of dollars for every kilowatt that you can supply to the grid. And what you'll see here is there's an asymptote where you hit zero. If you go below about, uh, I believe this is about 36%, you don't make any money. You can't make money from arbitrage. But there are actually two ways to get paid if you've got an energy storage resource. You can get arbitrage, buy low, sell high, but the grid will also pay you just to be on standby, to just wait. Wait, and whenever we dial you in, you be ready to discharge. And that's called a capacity payment. So they will, this is why you have spinning reserves and turbines that are just spinning, waiting to discharge just in case there's power that's needed. So you also get paid a capacity payment. So we build this framework. It's going to seem a little bit weird, a little bit non-intuitive, but it, it identifies a key thing for us, which is how much value is there for a particular resource that now has, uh, is a function of efficiency. So you take the, uh, the cost of the, of the total resource, which has two components in general. So there could be some components that scale with the amount of energy you store. In our case, that's like the size of the tanks, OK? Um, then you have other components that will scale with the size of how much power you want to be able to, how quickly you want to be able to discharge it. So you could scale that from 10 megawatt to 100 megawatt to a gigawatt. So there's a bunch of other components, the size of your heat engine, so to speak, that scales with the amount of power, the rate of charging and discharging. And so you got to choose both of those things. So we're going to call all the components that scale with the power, the CPP, the cost per unit power, all the components that scale with the amount of energy you store, the CPE, cost per unit energy. So then you have um, these capacity. You have, if you add this to this other side, this is the total cost of your entire thing. And we subtract that from the other side. I'll show you why. Then this, these, this term here, these terms here represent, this is how much money you can make. So, you can get a fixed capacity payment, plus you can get some payment due to arbitrage, but it's a function of your round trip efficiency according to this plot. So now, the amount of money you can make is a function of your efficiency. All right, so this framework, we then subtract this term to the other side, and that tells you what's the maximum amount you can spend on the cost per unit power to break even. If you're above that, there's no way you can make money. If you're below that, it means you could make money. Okay, so now we plot that. We plot that and several other technologies all on one plot. It's probably easier to read it off of this table. So this is the max cost per unit power for different technologies under the stated assumptions here. So we took lithium ion at that low asymptote at $150 a kilowatt hour. And what you see is the cost per unit power is negative. So what this tells you is that under these circumstances we assumed here, it's impossible for lithium ion to make money doing energy uh, storage under these assumptions. Um, conversely, the technology that I'm going to talk about is that has a positive value, and it turns out that our predicted cost per unit power is lower than this number, and therefore we expect that it will actually be a profitable resource. It actually could make money, similar to pumped hydro and also compressed air energy storage. Okay? So there are some technologies that could get there, uh, but the point is that lithium ion under these circumstances would not get there. All right, so what's the simplest version of how you could do this heat to electricity and back to, uh, back to heat, uh, back to electricity? Simplest thing you could do is just take a concentrated solar power plant and replace the entire field of mirrors and the receiver with a heater. All right, so you could do that. You could take in electricity from the grid, and you could heat up molten nitrate salt from what they operate now is about 250 degrees C, heat it up to 565 C, run it through a steam turbine. You'll get somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 38% efficiency. Um, and all this technology exists today. There's nothing new you have to develop here. You'd be putting together some components in a different way, but all the key pieces of this are already ready to go. The problem with this is the efficiency would be low, right? The heat engine would kill you. This is right around that cutoff point where you don't make any money due to arbitrage. Okay? Ideally, you'd like to be able to make money in both ways. So you can do something more clever. You can do something else. This is an approach that's now being pursued by a startup called Malta, actually here in the Boston area. Um, 
So this was developed, uh, this concept, I was it's actually cool, like side story, I was actually around when this concept first came out. Um, I had some colleagues at RPE that were working with uh, Bob Laughlin uh, to develop this idea. And um, I was, I, when they showed it to me, you know, originally my first thought is, well, you know, all the thermodynamic cycles have been come up with. How could you possibly have a new cycle? This is like a cold atom physicist and uh, uh, someone that works on um, uh, laser uh, light trapping um, and, and another physicist. And so I didn't, I didn't think that there might be any merit. But after I sat down and looked at it, it actually makes sense. And I was a little bit mad I didn't think of it first. So what they do here is they do not only hot storage but cold storage. And the main, main thing is don't just do joule heating. Instead, run a, run a heat pump. The reason a heat pump is smart is because you put in electricity, but the amount of heat you get out of it is greater than the amount of electricity you put in because it's basically like an air conditioner. You're cooling something, removing energy from that, pumping up the temperature, and now you can store more heat than what you put in as electricity. And so that actually helps to offset the thermodynamic penalty you pay on the way back when you'd run it as a heat engine. And so they are predicted to get round trip efficiencies in the range of 60 to 70%. This is much higher and this is much more attractive. And you could still, uh, uh, this looks very economically attractive. And so there's a company now that spun out of Google X that's uh, pursuing this. Our version, we do something very, very different. So we say, I'll stick with the dual heating, but I'm gonna try to turn the temperature up so high I can get um, a decent efficiency, but there are a couple other uh, interesting advantages that come out of this. And so our temperatures are going to sound ridiculously high, and they are. Um, we are essentially pushing the limits of, 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 of what materials can do. Um, our cold tank is 1,900 degrees C, so it's already glowing white hot. Our hot tank is 2,400 degrees C. This is essentially the temperature of an incandescent light bulb, and this is where the phrase sun in a box came from. This, my, one of my colleagues said, oh, man, he saw this diagram. He says, like, basically, you're trying to put the sun in a box. So um, you can take cold liquid silicon. We've actually found you can also mix in some iron and reduce the cost, and it's also compatible with all the materials we intend to use. Take in electricity, heat that silicon up to a very high temperature, 2,400 degrees C. That's the charging cycle. When you're then ready to discharge, you run that high temperature liquid through an, a heat engine. But now, one of the reasons we turn up the temperature so high is so that now you can use an alternative type of heat engine. There is no heat engine right now that can operate at this kind of peak turbine inlet temperature. It doesn't exist. So instead, because the entire infrastructure is glowing white, we can actually instead just convert the light. So you can actually use PV cells as the heat engine, so to speak. So instead of converting the heat, so to speak, we convert the light, which is a manifestation of the heat. So inside here, you have a big tubing array. So the liquid goes down these tubes, uh, or in this case, the way it's drawn, it goes up these tubes. Uh, so it cools as it goes through because it's losing energy. So these pipes are radiating, and these PV cells are absorbing some of the light and therefore taking out some of the energy, which then causes the liquid to cool. Um, I can go through a lot of details here. Let me maybe uh, point out one major thing is this, the PV cells are not normal PV cells. So these are typically people would refer to these as thermal photovoltaic cells. We tend to refer to them as multi-junction PV cells, largely because of one thing. We're trying to distance ourselves from TPV because TPV always has like is notably known to have very low efficiencies. And in this case, we're talking about getting to very high efficiencies. Why and how? So we think we can get to much higher efficiencies because the band gaps on our PV cells are actually the same or higher than what you would use for regular sunlight. So we're actually converting uh, the, a good fraction of what we're converting is actually visible light. All right? The second thing is that the intensity of the light is extremely high. So there's a lot of light coming out of an ob a black body, for example, at 2400 degrees C. Um, it's, it's several megawatts per meter, per meter squared. All right? So this thing is very power dense. So for a very small amount of PV area, you can get a lot of power. The other thing about these PV cells is they're actually grown on top of a mirror. So we are not able to make use of all the light. We're actually not able to make use of the majority of the light. So the majority of the light goes through the PV cell, hits the mirror, and goes right back to the pipes, keeping them hot. So you trap that light so that it actually doesn't get wasted. This is different than a normal PV cell. If you put a PV cell out in the sun and you put a mirror on the back, anything that came from the sun that you didn't get on that first pass just went out to the sky and you lost it. In our case, our sun is in a box. So now all this light stays inside the system, we don't lose it. All right, so these are the main features of this. this uh, the cells are, of course, actively cooled, otherwise they'd heat up. 
and not perform well. And also, we are not interested in doing a vac pulling a vacuum to try and get rid of convective losses. We take, take that hit. And instead, we've got a gas like uh, argon or krypton in the gap. All right. So the first next question you may ask is, well, what are you going to make this out of? All right. At these ridiculous temperatures, there are essentially only two mass manufactured, industrially manufactured materials that are even solid. Those two things are graphite and tungsten. And our entire system is made out of graphite and tungsten. Okay? Almost entirely out of graphite, there's only tungsten in one spot. All right? It's tungsten foil. Now, if you're thinking about materials uh, and you're talking about a liquid metal, um, the big issue, of course, would be corrosion. So you don't want to use tungsten piping because, generally speaking, if you've got a metal liquid and a solid metal, metal pipe, the liquid metal will dissolve away the solid metal pipe. The best analogy I can think of is uh, it'd be like trying to uh, pump sugar water through a pipe made out of sugar. You will quickly dissolve away your entire infrastructure. So this got us thinking about different classes of materials. And typically, most thermal infrastructures are built out of metals. So we're thinking different. We went back to the periodic table and you say, OK, well, there's metals down here, like tin, lead, bismuth. They have low melting points, which are nice. Um, and high boiling points that have a nice big liquidus range. But if you take one of the uh, metals over here in this range and you pair it with something in this top right corner, the borides, carbides, nitrides, oxides, and some silicides, these are all what we call ceramics. And the reason they're nice is because they are covalently bonded. And covalent bonds can be very stiff bonds. Stiff bonds do not like to break. Right? They have a very deep energy well. And that means that it's very difficult for these materials to be corroded, meaning they don't want to exchange that very strong bond they have for a weaker bond. So by using ceramics with liquid metals, we can actually enter into regimes where we actually have the materials that are uh, thermodynamically stable with respect to each other. There's no corrosion at any time scale. It's a beauty beautiful regime to operate in. So our key new idea was to use liquid metal with ceramics rather than um, metal piping. Now, next question you might say, is how are you going to pump it? And if you're going to use ceramics, how are you going to seal it? Right? One of the main reasons we use metal for an entire infrastructure is because you can weld it. You can weld it shut, and you're not, it's not going to leak. But if you're going to use ceramics, you can't weld ceramics. So this was our big contribution. Uh, we had a paper that came out in 2017. We spent several years trying to develop this. It took a while before we eventually figured it out. But essentially, the secret sauce in what we do is effectively we have figured out how to seal ceramic joints. Right, so we can make an all graphite system. Every connection is all graphite, uh, and we can flow liquid metal through it. So the first test we did was with liquid tin. Uh, we actually made an all ceramic pump. It's actually made out of aluminum nitride, boron nitride composite. And this is kind of what the setup looks like. This is an actual uh, snapshot of this test while it's running. So we pumped liquid tin at 1350C. All right. Um, so it's the hottest pump on record. And we actually could have gone hotter. Um, the reason we didn't go hotter was because we ran out of heater power. Right? So this is where it stagnated. We ran out of heater power because we thought, we was like, if we do this, everybody told us we weren't going to be able to do it. And we said, if we do this, we have to get it on video. So we had to make a hole in the insulation. If you make a hole in the insulation, a bunch of light is going to get out. And so we lost a bunch of heat doing that. So we couldn't, have gone, couldn't go hotter. But we could go hotter. And we're planning to go hotter very soon to actually try to pump at 2,400 degrees uh, C. All right, so that's 1,400 C, but what about 2,400 degrees C? That's, a, that's literally 1,000 degrees hotter, OK? So uh, proving 1,400 degrees C may not convince you. Uh, the second thing is, what about the tank, right? So um, if you're going to do 2,400 degrees C and you got a tank, you can't make some giant graphite 10 meter diameter, 10 meter tall tank. There's no facility that can make something that large as one single piece. So it's got to be made out of multiple pieces. If you're going to make multiple pieces, now that means multiple pieces of solid have to be joined, and you now have to have a seal at that joint, otherwise liquid's coming out. And so that was the next problem we took, um, took on. And we want to use silicon and not tin. Tin is nice because tin does not interact chemically with carbon at all. There's no tin carbon phase diagram, so to speak. But silicon does. So silicon and graphite react to form silicon carbide. But it's known that if you bring silicon contact with uh, graphite, you will form a silicon carbide layer that will then protect the rest of the graphite so you don't eat all the graphite if you've got dense enough graphite. And so we tested this out. 
Uh, we have done a number of tests in this regard. But then we, the key piece is we developed a seal. So what you're seeing here is a test piece. This is a little miniature test tank. It's two pieces that are screwed together with carbon fiber bolts. So everything's got to be carbon, either carbon or tungsten. So we've got carbon fiber in there for increased strength. And so this is the miniature tank cut in half, so you can see what's inside. So there's the silicon, then there's the seal. So this is a graph oil seal right here at the bottom, and then it's screwed together so that the liquid, which wants to go out through that seal, through that seam, cannot get out. And it turns out it works. It took us a few tries. The first, first few actually broke themselves apart, but we figured out the right way to do it so we actually get it to seal. And what happens is the silicon reacts with the sealing material, forms silicon carbide, and then seals itself off. So none of the other silicon actually can get through. This is great. We also tried this with 50% iron and silicon. That works. If you go far above this and go like, if you go pure iron and you do this, you'll find the walls of this graphite have been uh, taken away because carbon dissolves in iron. And so uh, if you do it with iron and silicon, you can actually make this work. All right, the next question you might ask is, well, why are you using PV and it's not a turbine? You said a turbine doesn't exist at the temperatures you want, but fine, why not turn the temperature down? Make everything easier, just go to a lower temperature and use a turbine. Well, the problem is that developing a turbine, even, even if you want to do this at 1500 C, that turbine doesn't exist. You might say, well, it's the same as a natural gas combined cycle. In principle, yes, but not in practice. In reality, you've now got what you have to take the place of the combustor and, exchange, and turn it into a heat exchanger. And that's got to be external, that's going to be a huge component. And the aerodynamics of how the fluid gets into the turbine is now affected. So you have to redesign, you have to rethink the entire turbine. You can't just say, I'll just put a, put a heat exchanger on the side and run everything the same. There's some re-optimization that has to happen. It's a new product. And if you want GE or Siemens to build a new turbine for you, that is a more than $100 million investment for them to do all that testing and to develop that product. And that's a huge barrier to deployment because you've now got to convince one of just a handful of companies to undertake this big R&D project. Instead, uh, well, the other, let me see, uh, the other piece of this is you don't get this fast response time. And so I'll talk about that. Um, one of the things I didn't emphasize when I showed you the system is that those PV cells um, can actually be inserted and pulled out and actuated in and out of the light. And that's a huge benefit because now that means we can ramp from full off to full on in a matter of seconds rather than hours. And you'd lose that if you did a, a turbine. So with multi-junction PV, we get a couple benefits. Big benefit is reduced barrier to deployment. I can potentially come up with this and get this out there in the next decade or so for less than $100 million of R&D on just the heat engine. Um, the second aspect is that the PV actually can be much lower cost than a turbine. So we save on cost, and the cost per unit power is not negligible. And so that's actually an important piece. We can get near the same range of efficiency, 50 percent-ish. Um, I don't think we'll break 60 with this approach. You could potentially break 60 with a turbine. Uh, but we get the faster response time. So there's some trade-offs, but I think this may, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons why it makes sense uh, to go in the direction of PV. Next question you might say was, why, do, why would I do multi-junction PV? Why not just single junction, keep it simple? This is something new, keep it simple, get it out there. Then you can start doing all kinds of other things. And it turns out the way PV is built, these cells that we would make, even if it was a single junction, you might as well add the second junction because the cost doesn't like blow up with the addition of the second junction. They have to grow some additional layers. There's some additional design work to be done, but it's not like the cost is a factor of two higher because you added a second junction. It's actually uh, a very small amount higher. And you can see there's significant benefit to adding a second junction. So here are plots. This is the bottom junction uh, uh, band gap on the x-axis here. This is the efficiency. So here you can see comparing this line to this line, you get almost a, a, about a 5% overall boost on efficiency with the ad addition of a second junction. So it's, it's substantial, and it makes sense. It's worthwhile to do that. Uh, we also have designs for these kinds of cells that are right in the target range of uh, band gaps, and so we're working with uh, some of the best PV people in the world at uh, National Renewable Energy Lab uh, to actually get these the cells designed now. <laughs>
Uh, I'll skip this part, but basically in the picture I showed you, there's actually tungsten foil fins that are in here. Uh, you get some enhancement in the amount of light that hits the PV cells. I'll show you later when you actually, uh, the, the light coming out of tungsten is not black body, it's a shiny metal. And so you actually get a reduced amount of light that's incident. And so it, it makes sense to actually increase the total amount of area so you actually get more light. It increases the power density of the whole system um, and helps drop the cost even more and improve the efficiency. So uh, this is one thing we're also looking at. Um, one key thing that's a distinction between our work and a lot of previous work, many people have tried to, they've worked at lower temperatures where the power density is not as high, and so, and they often try to do various things to actually um, cut the losses. One of the losses is convection between the hot side and the cold PV. And in our case, we just take that hit. By going to such high temperatures, um, we're in a regime where the, um, the convective, convective loss is only about four to five uh, kilowatts per square meter, and so this is totally tolerable in comparison to the uh, 100 plus kilowatts per square meter that we're getting as power output. All right, so it pales in comparison. Um, I'll skip this, but basically there's one other issue that, that is a potential reliability issue with these cells. It's essentially you're making like an evaporator. You have very high temperature emitter right next to something very cold, and you could easily deposit the hot material right onto the cold material via, via mass transport. Let me just walk you quickly through the argument around the system efficiency. So if I take the nominal temperature, so halfway between 24 and um, 1900 degrees C is 2150. A black body at that temperature emits almost two megawatts for every square meter of area. It's a lot of power. Tungsten, however, has a low emissivity, uh, so we don't get all of that. So the light coming out of tungsten is, uh, is like a third of that. Then we're only converting, here's our band gaps, we're only converting this portion of the spectrum, what's to the left. So we're not converting all the light. All this is unused light that actually gets reflected. And by having a very high reflectivity cell, we only absorb a small fraction of that, uh, that portion of the light as well. And so when you account for all of this, you look at the PV cells. Um, uh, we have models for how they would perform. You get about 120 kilowatts per square meter. You get a bunch of heat generation. And you get some absorption below band gap. And if you also add in the convection that I showed you on the previous slide, the total amount of heat going in here is about 235 kilowatts per square meter. You take the 123 kilowatts per square meter output, divide by that, and you get 52%. All right? So this is the range of efficiency that we're expecting. Almost done. Uh, here's the cost. Main thing to show you here is that we have two versions of our cost model, one that is very conservative, one that is much less conservative. And the most conservative version gets us with a cost per unit energy of around uh, 40 to $45 per kilowatt hour and a cost per unit power of about uh, 40 cents a watt. And we have another version if we make certain changes, certain changes to the system that lower the cost, which are a little bit more risky, they require a little bit more development. Uh, this could get our cost down to between five and $10 and uh, around 20 cents a watt. And it's important to see here, when we get to this 20 cents a watt regime, what's dominating is the cooling system. So you got a dry cooling system outside and that's actually the predominant thing we're paying for. The PV cells actually become almost free in that case. All right, so this is what the system would look at at scale. Just give you a quick depiction. 100 megawatts, 10 hours of storage. That's a gigawatt hour of storage. You can see a little truck down there with a person. Uh, so this is the size of the tanks that you would need. Uh, but this is a, a substantial amount of storage uh, for, a, for a grid scale battery. The beauty of it, again, is that it's extremely power dense. So the pumps you need are actually only like a foot in diameter. All right, so they're actually small. You don't need very high flow rates because there's just so much energy in every cubic meter of that fluid. There we go. So what's next? Last slide. Uh, we're in the process of building a prototype. Uh, we just got our lab uh, opened up for us, and um, we have a um, very large vacuum chamber that we're going to um, put this system in. This is about 10 feet long, 5 feet in diameter, so it's plenty of space for us to put lots of insulation. Uh, and so this full prototype with two pumps, two tanks, PV cells, a heater, all that's going to go inside here so we can actually test a full prototype that we can charge and discharge it. And with that, I'll uh, show some acknowledgments and happy to take any questions you may have.
So the main advantage we have over, um, we have two advantages over the pumped heat storage approach. One is our cost per unit energy is lower because we're actually able to swing the temperature delta T uh, bigger than them. And so in the case of um, molten nitrate salt, they go up to 565C and down to melting point of the salt is like 250. So they got about a, you know, a little less than 300 degree delta T and we can go to 500. We can actually even go to uh, higher because uh, we're f pretty far above the melting point of the material. So melting point is like 1550 or so. If, when you alloy it, it's gonna be more like 1500. So we, it actually, we've done some economics, it actually makes sense to actually have the delta T go even further down and take the hit on the, um, on the PV efficiency by going down to a lower temperature. Second advantage we have is that the uh, is the discharge time. Uh, I'm sorry, the 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 ramp rate, right? Remember, so I told you the PV can dip in and out, and that's one advantage that they don't also have. But I do think their approach is quite competitive. Uh, let's take one more Right. So, so, so the way that model is built, it's independent of the size. So it's just cost per unit energy at, evaluated at some size. Most of the other technologies are rather modular or they, uh, if they're not, we're taking that value at a large enough scale where it is cost effective. Um, in the case of batteries, making them bigger doesn't make them any cheaper. And so they don't get any, any benefit from that. Um, and so what, what the main reason to pick a size and say 100 megawatts, 10 hours of storage, is to one, um, show you the scale where our approach, the, 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 the power and energy scale where our approach would become cost effective. Yeah, but then like, like the meter cubes, like the actual size of the battery. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm referring to. So, so you have a certain energy density, um, which is order of hundreds of kilowatt hours per meter cubed. And so we need to be big enough so that those heat, that heat leakage is suppressed.